Wonderful. Why don't we open with a word of prayer? Oh. Forgot my wife. No. No. <laughs> my grandchildren are really enthusiastic and so they're like running out the parking lot. Good job. Father God, thank Father God, you so, thank so much for the, for the saints that are saints gathered that are here in the sanctuary today. today. We do ask, we do by ask the power of your Holy Spirit, Spirit, that you would guide our, guide our worship today, today Father. Father. We do ask we by the power of your Holy Spirit, Spirit that you would guide us guide in your us word in your today, word and guide us in our us prayers, prayers as, we pray as we pray for each, for each other, as we pray for, for those, those in our lives, in our lives whom we are concerned, we are concerned for, for, as we pray for, we ourselves, pray for ourselves, as we pray for your, pray church. For your church. Lord, we seek Lord, your direction. We seek only to do your will. And we seek see now, now that you assume your rightful place right as place the pastor and pastor teacher of this teacher church, of this church and of the and church, of church as we move, as forward, we move forward together, together in, Jesus name. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
be seen. Be joy. Sing along.
Today we're going to look at a very complex matter of the Christian faith. That is the issue of peace. Peace. Christians are often accused of being anything but peaceful. Christians are often accused of causing dissent and creating disaccord. We want to find out what is taught in Scripture by going into Scripture. And as usual, we have a bunch of it to open up today. Three different Scriptures. You might find similarities in all three. You will find similarities in all three. You will find vast differences in all three. And in order to understand this nature of God's peace and what it means to the Christian individually and to the Christian church movement, We need to understand that it's not as simple as the surface level things that you might read in scripture, some of which we're going to begin with now, with Isaiah 9. You know, you've heard this. I know you've heard this. Christian or not, most people have heard this beautiful, one of the most beautiful passages of scripture that is written. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel, and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery, and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod, just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms blood-stained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. Beautiful. And throughout the Christmas season and at other times, we refer to Jesus Christ as the Prince of Peace. We have a neat song that we sing in here, Prince of Peace. And we like that imagery, the Prince of Peace. And on the surface, it is wonderful, and it's wonderful to speak about. The government is on his shoulders, and he is the Prince of Peace. In his arms, we will never experience any discord. We will never experience any violence. We will never experience anything but peace. And we know, as Christians, that that is not true. So how do we reconcile those two things? Because that would be the accusation that is charged against us. We preach peace, we cause war. We preach peace, yet we fill in the blank to cause division. This is what we have to come to terms with. We were speak speaking with some fellows this morning that we need to have more than a second grade Christian education in the world today. Satan is quite sophisticated. And the lies that are tearing our families apart, the lies that are tearing marriages apart, the lies that are tearing churches apart are very sophisticated. Knowing exactly, Satan knows exactly where to go, what buttons to push, how to get around. Did God really say that? All of these different things. So when we are accused of being anything but peaceful, or we are accused of causing division, how do we respond? How do we respond when people would say, Jesus, that Prince of Peace of yours, where is he now in this war? That war, the threat of nuclear war, all these different things. Look back at the 20th century. Look at what happened there. Where was the Prince of Peace when hundreds of millions of people were slaughtered in war? Anyone? <laughs> He's there. Is the answer. And if we take a careful look at Isaiah 9, we'll 
we'll see that the people are being persecuted. That the only peace in the opening part of Isaiah 9, the only peace that they really know is peace through strife, as we would call it. Peace that is caused by military might. Invading armies, calming down all of the discord and having some sort of tenuous peace through strength. And that is one sort of peace when people are not fighting together. And we read about that. The boot, or we talk about, you will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as a people at the harvest like warriors dividing the plunder. What? For you will break the yoke of their slavery, lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod, just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. Peace through strength. That's certainly one, that is, and that is a very worldly, that is a very political definition of peace. It is a peace that we have lived with most of my lifetime. And, and, and you and the folks that are generations older than me, the whole idea of mutually assured destruction kept the peace between the world's great superpowers. How crazy is that? If you shoot at me, I, you know you will be shot back and then therefore we don't shoot at each other. That is human definition of peace. Is that a good one? No, it's not a very good one. That has caused a lot of angst over generation and generation and generation and generation. That is not a very good one. But that's the definition that we open up with here. You've destroyed the armies of Midian. You've broken the slavery that your people were under, and you're going to keep control of this, and there will be peace in the land. And if there's not peace, we're going to war. But then there is a transition, because there is a time when the boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. Why? Because there's a transition in human nature. There's a transition that occurs in the heart of those who will believe. For unto us a child is born, a son is given to us. The government will rest upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There is a transition. The supernatural is breaking in. An eschatological inbreaking, is what we would call that. God manifest on earth a different definition of being Jesus Christ fully human yet fully divine perfectly moral does not carry around the definitions of peace that we do he's not there to say well if you shoot at me I'll shoot at you and that sort of thing he's entirely different than his broken human nature he brings with himself a different definition of peace and much like the kingdom of God, that definition of peace is both operating now and is still yet to come. We talk about that with the kingdom of God. Here we are, kingdom of God dwellers. It is happening now and it is still yet to come in the final completion. That definition of peace is operating now as the Christian indwelled by God's Holy Spirit has the opportunity to taste of the goodness of God right now and the goodness that will flow from God through them and bring peace in their lives. Peace regardless of their circumstances. A contentment that indwells the Christian that is unlike, does not indwell non-Christians. A peace that we can have during political turmoil, social turmoil, economic turmoil, family turmoil, marital turmoil, regardless of circumstances. A peace that we have when times are great and a peace that we have when times are terrible. We have a taste of that now. And if we intentionally press into that, we will experience that. But is it complete? No. Because I try to see, and I preach this all, there, like, here was my picture before uh, God indwelled me and opened my eyes. Here is my picture now, and I understand that my circumstances are just pieces of that picture. 
I, I am very intentional, I think, about living that way and thinking that way and praying that way, yet I will go and get mad and my dog crew runs away and start cussing and blah, blah, blah. what's going on? The peace breaks down. I'm not like, oh, Susie, here, God bless you. Whenever you return home, I'm fine with that. I never, you know what I'm saying? Now that's a kind of a silly example, but it, added, it overflows into your life. It overflows into your marriages. Boom. It overflows into to a, a parent-child relationship. Boom. It overflows into fill in the blank. At work, wherever the case may be, and your peace breaks down. Why? Because it's not complete. And you may need to now, there it happened, there it happened. Now you need to take a step back and be, again, intentional in your thinking and in your praying and in your understanding and in your allowing the peace of God to reign in your life and praying and anticipating the day when it will be complete. And there will not be that breakdown of that human nature to want to fight, to want to get grow angry, to want to do bad things, think bad things. I hope that that makes sense. Because the Lord teaches us in Scripture, we're going to see it again. Well, this is the sermon per se. The scripture readings later on are going to reinforce what we're talking about here. We see it all in one section of one psalm. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. It is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of humankind. Through him, we will be drawn and reconciled into a relationship with the holy God, Yahweh. And because of the completed work on the cross, the advent of God's Holy Spirit, we will be indwelled with the very spirit, the very power that raised Christ from the dead. We can never underestimate that. But yet, we are simultaneously sinner and saint. It is not complete. Until Christ returns, And the glory is given in earnest in our physical bodies and our spiritual natures. So take heart, Christian. We talked about the 20th century. You know what caused hundreds of millions of people to be slaughtered in wars? It was the advent, if you will, of the God is dead movement that moved all throughout the world. There is no God. There is no. There are no absolutes. And when you remove absolutes from the picture of millions of people, literally, and I mean this, all hell will break loose in them. Because now nobody believes in anything except themselves, or perhaps their own political power, or agenda, or economic power, whatever. And man, we went at it, right? When the philosophers declared God is dead, all bets were off. And you see the result. If you know your history, you see the result. Christians know that we serve the Prince of Peace. We know that one of the gifts that is given by the power of his Holy Spirit is the picture that we have of our world and our circumstance and the divine peace that is given to us because we have security in Christ. Knowing, knowing that to live in this earthly vessel is to be with Christ by the power of the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, and to leave this earthly vessel is to be with Christ, because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That opens up a whole, a whole way of thinking that is anything but hurtful to another person. You are secure. You have grounded. You know of absolutes. You move through life seeing things, good and evil, that others do not because of the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. You are capable and when a person is secure, when a person knows themselves, 
when a person it has their feet firmly planted in those absolutes, they, they are not, they do not lash out at others. They do not try to get self-esteem or any other kind of validation from other people because they know who they are in the Lord. And we are okay with that. I am a son of the Most High God. I didn't know who I was until God opened my eyes and showed me who I am and who he is. And now, that's where my validation comes from. I don't need to lash out for power. I don't need to lash out for self-esteem. I don't need to lash out for fill in the blank. Because I am Brian one, born a rebel, saved by the grace of God. Moving forward, the absolute, the best that I can by the power of his spirit, making all the mistakes along the way, stepping back, regrouping, finding perspective, praying, seeking wisdom, and moving forward again. And that's what we can do. We can, we can be Christians one day at a time. Amen? Amen. We're going to light this candle of peace. I have a couple of other scriptures to review. Again, you are going to hear many similarities. Isaiah 9 is our baseline, right? And I showed how it talks about worldly peace and then the transition. You're going to hear how Jesus speaks. We heard it last week about peace. And then how Jesus seemingly contradicts himself 100% speaking about peace. We're going to try to make sense out of that very quickly. But we're going to light this candle of peace. And I would ask you to rise and sing with us. We are going to sing through these choruses two times each as we just celebrate the advent of the Christ. The first is 154, what can I give?
times in your prayers do you pray that? I mean, you sing it here at church. We sing a lot about the glory of God. We, we sing a lot about all the worship of God. Do you include that in your prayers? Do you declare him worthy? Do you say things like that about him? Do you flat out just thank him? Like all these amazing, and I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to sound like accusatory, but we should. We should. We say we follow the one true God. He alone is worthy of our worship. Let him tell him, you alone are worthy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for this understanding of love and of peace that I have. We see how those definitions of love and peace are set against the definitions of the world. So I'm going to tell you up front, because we studied this scripture last week, that this is what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is not talking about Christians going into the world and chopping up people and doing all kinds of horrible things. Dividing them. He's talking about the reality of a godless world and the inbreaking of God into that, into the darkness shown a light. Well, darkness and light are opposite of one another. Into the wicked world came the goodness of God. Good and evil are opposite of one another. And the point that Jesus is making is the fact that from our own selves and our own divided, right, natures, where we want to be evil one minute and follow God the next minute, to our most, the closest relationships, our marriages, our, our, our uh, family relationships, our, all those church relations, all the different things, the closest relationship, he's making a point. That it matters not who that person is in your life. Followers of God understand reality. Non-followers of God understand whatever is set before them as their reality. Does that make sense? Narrow vision. This is what is set before me. This is the reality that I know. When God opens my eyes, I see a larger picture. So this is what we're talking about when we go to Matthew 10, verse 26. But don't be afraid of those who threaten you, for the time is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed, and all that is secret will be made known to all. The time is coming. But in the meantime, what I tell you now in the darkness, shout abroad when the daybreak comes. What I whisper in your ear, Shout from the housetops for all to hear. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill you, kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God, who is sovereign, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. You see the, how he's setting it up. Just what I told you. There is good and there is evil. There is darkness, there is light. There is right, there is wrong. They're not going to coexist at the same space in the same time. They can't. And we know evil exists. So when good comes into the world by the power of God, it's quite natural that we're going to grate against one another. Jesus is telling us this much. And understanding this as a Christian takes you beyond your Bible stories into, oh my goodness, being a Christian is... Discipling, being a disciple of Christ, all the good, all the bad, all the beatings, all the everything. It's more than knowing a few scripture verses or knowing a few Bible stories. Walking with Christ is walking with Christ. Hello, do you know where Christ walked? It's, you know, we'll preach that again at Easter and we do every Easter. You want to walk with Christ? Put that cross on your back and carry it up to the hill. Okay. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father's knowing it. 
and the very hairs on your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. And I just always wonder, is Jesus being a little snarky there? You're more important than a whole flock of sparrows. Either way, it's like just a fantastic image. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. No one comes with the Father but through me. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. For those who have known the goodness and rejected it have condemned themselves. John 3, 17, 18. I love John 3, 16. 17, 18. Everyone's like, hmm, wake you up a little bit. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace but uh, to the earth. I came not to bring peace but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. This he, He's not messing around here. Your enemies are enemies. The, the language itself is divisive, right? But it's divisive by nature because there is truth and there are lies. And it's hard to get around the language to be so inclusive that everybody feels good. You just can't. But the enemies of Christ are those who are following Satan in the world. They're all around us. But Jesus doesn't go into that vast top of the funnel teaching and bring it down. He goes right into the teaching that your enemies may be right in your own household. Your closest relation goes right to it, right to the heart, right to the point. And it hurts a lot of us. It hurts a lot. That gets our attention. You, you have to admit, because I know there are people going through my head right now, and I would venture to guess that the majority of people in the sanctuary this morning have people going through their heads right now. Like, man, I wish they were saved. I wish they were saved. I wish they knew Jesus. I wish they would walk with Jesus. I love them so much, and it's chilling me. That's where Jesus is going. He doesn't beat around the bush. He goes right to it. And he grabs people by the heart and he starts shaking it. This is how important it is. Your daughter is at stake. Your son is at stake. Your husband, your wife are at stake. The people you love are at stake. He doesn't mess around with generalities. It goes back to what we say. What can we do? Yes, I would love. I would love. And God indwells me. And I am the, the internet Billy Graham, and I preach, and six billion people are saved. I, yeah, I, I want everyone to be saved, but I can't. Chances are, sovereign God, who knows, but chances are that's not going to happen. But what I can do is talk to my brother. What I can do is talk to my sister. What I can do is talk to the waitress. What I can do is talk to and have decent human conversations with people. So they can know Christ, not just because I'm very knowledgeable biblically, but they know Christ because of the way I am behaving and the way I am speaking to them and the perspective that I have on life. It's always weird at funerals. That's the weirdest part about funerals. And, and especially on, like Tuesday, it was a very large funeral. Very large and very diverse. So when you preach, one of the things that I begin with is, this is a Christian funeral. This is why we do it this way. Because we believe this. So you will see and you will hear Christians celebrate birth, rebirth through baptize, baptizing, baptism, um, marriages. We make a big deal out of marriages and we make a big deal out of the transition from this vessel out of the body to be with Christ. We make a big deal out of funerals. Everything has its place and its purpose. And it's an opportunity just to simply speak of the very worldview that I carry, the very presentation of reality that is the truth of Scripture in a very hopefully positive, encouraging way. Because look, this man died a Christian brother. And these Christian uh, people who are here today, yes, they are grieving, but man, they are celebrating 
rejoicing because they have hope. They know that death is just one piece of a much bigger picture. And I hope that that message comes through and people grow curious and want to ask more questions. But Jesus goes right to it. And that's what we need to understand. This is not a hateful preaching. This is a very poignant preaching. He's not teaching you to go out and divide your families and do all these things. He's telling you that this is what is going to happen as a result of the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. And your call then is what you do next as a Christian. Anyone who receives you receives me. I'm a Christian. I pray that wherever I am, whatever I'm preaching a wedding or a funeral or in front of you or at the grocery store or whatever, wherever they see me, they can see Christ. Whenever they're speaking with me, et cetera, et cetera. You all know that. Not me, Christians, right? If you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, you will be given the same reward as a prophet. If you receive righteous people because of the righteousness, now you will be given a reward like theirs. And if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. Speaking of which, this weather is going to I might have to stop preaching because I have to sing tonight. Okay, so there you go. Now I told you that I wasn't necessarily going to preach to you, but I think it's so important that we raise our level one of biblical understanding. Christianity is more than platitudes. Those are just sayings that sound nice. Christianity is more than Bible stories. We begin with the Bible stories, but then we take our children and we grow and we grow and we grow and we grow. And Christianity is more than living in a bubble, ignoring the rest of the world. It doesn't work that way. Understanding what scripture teaches and understanding what it means to be a Christian, a Christ follower, is desperately important as we move one day at a time in this common world of South Central PA. Who would think? Well, who would think anything good came from Nazareth? I'm raising another preacher over here. You can hear it. Bring it, Papa. <laughs> Now we have this. How do we reconcile this with what you just heard? Now, this is where, right, you've heard Isaiah 9, <coughs> the teaching of the world, the transition of Christ. You've heard the teaching of Christ, Christ in the world. He's bringing division because good and evil can't exist at the same place at the same time. So now what do we make of this scripture from John? You're going to determine this. This is your home. We're going to read this. I may make a couple of comments. If I go too far, doc, go like this. Because I want you all to think about it. I want you all to talk about it today over lunch and dinner and with your families. How do you reconcile this teaching with what you just heard? I have told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. Lots of similarities. Lots of differences. For you will be expelled from the synagogues. And the time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing a holy service for God. This is because they have never known the Father or me. Yes, I'm telling you these things now so that when they happen, you will remember my warning. I didn't tell you earlier because I was going to be with you for a while longer. But now I am going away from the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking where I am going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I don't go away, then I, if I do go away, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. Just got to say it, good and evil, okay? There it is. He's, he's preaching it. Good's coming. Guess what? Evil hates it. Okay? The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Covered 
by the blood of Christ. Judgment will become will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, then he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me, the Holy Spirit of God. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. In a little while, you won't see me anymore. But a little while after that, you'll see me again. Some of the disciples ask each other, what does he mean when he says, in a little while, you won't see me? But then you will see me, and I am going to the Father. And what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand any of this. Jesus realized they wanted to ask him about it, so he said, are you asking yourselves what I meant? I said, in a little while, you won't see me, but a little while after that, you will see me again. I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me, but the world will rejoice. Ouch. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. It will be like a woman suffering the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives way to great joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and then you will rejoice. And no one can rob you of that joy. At that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth. You will ask the Father directly, and he will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name. You will receive, and you will have abundant joy. I have spoken of these matters in figures of speech, but soon I will stop speaking figuratively and will tell you plainly all about the Father. Then you will ask in my name. I'm not saying I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you dearly because you love me and because and believe that I came from God. Yes, I came from the Father into the world, and now I will leave the world and return to the Father. Then the disciples said, At last you are speaking plainly and not figuratively. Now we understand that you know everything, and there's no need to question you. From this we believe that you came from God. Jesus asked, Do you finally believe? But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now, when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Most of the time, most of the time, we will speak and we will preach verse 33. But verse 33 begins with what? Because I have told you, right? I have told you all of this. What did he tell them? That's the important part. That's taking it from the second grade education on. We can read verse 33. Oh, we have peace in God. He has overcome the world of sorrows, but he has overcome the world. And that's beautiful. And I'm not going to poo-poo that if you carry that verse around in your heart. It's a wonderful verse to carry around. But everything that comes before it is really important. Because he says, I've told you all of this. Because I've told you all of this so that you will understand what it means to follow me. The depth and the breadth of our relationship, Christ and me. The depth and the breadth of what it means to be a Christian in the world. The depth and the breadth of what it means to have that conflict of good and evil, darkness and light. The time is coming, you'll be dragged up on the sin of You'll be beaten and you'll be whipped and all of these different things. I've told you all of that so you can have peace. Go home. Figure that one out. That's your homework. Do we have there something about that name up there? Would you stand as you're able? Let's sing this together. 
as you begin to reconcile in your own hearts, all of that talk about good and evil and Christ bringing peace. The peace of God be with you. If you're staying, we will be praying. And if you're not, may the peace of God go with you. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name.